Let's um, start on time. I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the annual uh, Bernard Zimmerman Research Symposium. This is, uh, this is a tradition here that honors uh, Bernard Zimmerman, who is, uh, who is the first chair of surgery at West Virginia University School of Medicine. And traditionally, it's been a symposium of uh, resident research, but uh, we also take the opportunity to bring in someone who's important in American surgery. And this year, we're honored to have Dr. O'Neill. Uh, James O'Neill is uh, Emeritus Professor and Chair of the Section of Surgical Sciences at uh, Vanderbilt University, and uh, he is uh, as well known as being the former Surgeon-in-Chief and Program Director in the uh, training program Pediatric Surgery, where uh, Dr. Art Ross, our, our, our former Dean, uh, Nick Shorter, who's currently on staff as uh, Chief of Pediatric Surgery, and and I have uh, all trained at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is a um, photograph, which is the obligatory photograph. You can uh, see Dr. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this is Dr. Anil, of course, and he hasn't changed much, and Nick, of course, has not changed much. This is Dr. Ross, and I'm not sure who this guy is, but uh, but this goes to show you how far back we go. But you know, it's interesting if, if, we, if, you, if you if you talk about mentorship, which is which is huge. Um, there's no mentorship like someone who you really grew up with, and uh, Dr. O'Neill certainly is, is that for me. And uh, this is the signed, uh, my uh, treasured possession of a signed autograph copy, which you see in uh, my office, but you see in nearly every office in every surgeon's office who, who, who treasures a relationship. And he or she always has a picture of his or her chair or someone important to him in surgery, and certainly. Dr. Neal occupies that place, but uh, importantly, as importantly as this, and this is this is a notebook, and I I, I keep a notebook. It's a six-ring notebook that, that you keep in your pocket, and I took notes because the notes that you get in your dictated summary never does the operation justice. And this is this is the notes that I took after a pull-through procedure that I did with Dr. Neal, a suave procedure, and it's notes about. You know, if you can read real closely, it's notes about how to prep patients and how you know how to position patients. The stuff that you don't really, uh, really uh, keep track of. But but this is this is this is as <laughs> as ancient as it gets. And I also have one for his the way that he does pectus escavatum repair, and one that how he does his hernia repairs. And so this uh, this uh, this lives on. And that relationship lives on. So that's, uh, he's always been a supporter. And this is when I was at Mercer. And he's supported educational efforts wherever I've gone. And this is when he was, when I went to, of all places, Macon, Georgia. And uh, Dr. Neal was there. And similarly, he is here to help this particular educational event. So please join me in uh, welcoming Jim O'Neill, who's very important in my life. And I'm sure that he'll, uh, he'll give us a great talk on something that's been important to him recently. Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is this too loud? Yeah, it sounds too loud. Move it down a little bit. How's that? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm uh, honored to be here, uh, and uh, particularly honored because there are three people here who are very special to me, and you heard a little bit about that story. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. And that is uh, because it's easier for me to interact with you if you move down. So as many people as feel comfortable, let's put it this way, all the short coat doctors move down. <laughs> See, I'm from Tennessee. I'm used to everybody getting together for music. So. All right. I think we can interact a little bit better, and, um, and I hope this is going to work now. Um, uh, 
and I'll just get put it up. And okay. Well, first of all, let me just pick up on Dr. Nakayama's initial um, introduction when he mentioned the Zimmerman Symposium. Does everybody here know who Dr. Zimmerman was? Well, I'm not going to embarrass you. Uh, but let, let me put it this way. Um, the fact that you have memorial lectures and important events uh, is a part of your roots, your medical roots, that are among the most important possessions you will have as you proceed through your life in medicine. These are things to be cherished. Now, I can tell you my first recollection, I never knew Dr. Zimmerman, but I knew what he had done. Uh, I came along at a time, um, and this is at the time that I picked up on who he was, I came along at a time when um, there was a big effort to uh, initiate total parenteral nutrition, and I also was involved um, in the Army at the time of the Vietnam conflict. And there were some things that were desperately needed for both those ventures. One for rapid resuscitation, the other was for long-term intravenous nutrition. And Dr. Zimmerman was the first person in the world uh, to put a central venous catheter in was polyethylene tubing at the time, but he was the first one to think about how you could develop a simple technology for managing uh, nutritional support, etc. If he did nothing else in life, that would have been a major contribution uh, because that has been an enduring contribution. Probably as important was coming here from Minnesota and I think it was 1960, something like that, uh, the beginning of this school, um, where he established um, medical education here, and particularly surgical care, and he made it regional. Now, those are things I knew about him for a long time. Um, so become conversant with that. I did know Dr. Watney. Um, and his work in oncology. And I knew Dr. Moran, who probably was the world expert in antidiuretic hormone and its effects um, in trauma, particularly uh, inappropriate ADH secretion. So if you look into those people whom Dr. Zimmerman gathered around him, you can see that this uh, has very important implications that are, I think, a wonderful part of your tradition. So I, as I, it just flashed through my mind as I heard him talk about uh, this. And so I'd offer that for you. All right, well, <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is to uh, probably speak mainly to the students and the residents. Um, I have been... Um, involved in going overseas for well over 30 years someplace. I had to start early on during vacation time. During the time that I knew Drs. Nakayama and Shorter in Philadelphia, I was going to China uh, for long periods of time. And since uh, 2002, um, my wife and I have been going to Africa. Um, and over the years, I've learned a fair amount. And so I thought you might enjoy hearing a little bit about um, our global surgical effort and what simple trips have grown into. I don't know how many of you read the New York Times. I know Dr. Shorter does. Um, but in the New York Times, if you look at the Sunday or even during the week, they'll have um, a travel section on Sunday and travel stories otherwise, and there's always a column that says, if you go, 
So this is a talk on if you go, what can you expect? I mean, this has to do with uh, surgical efforts in, in Africa. And what made me and some of my colleagues say that this should be developed into more than simply a clinical trip. Um, so now I spend two months a year in rural Kenya. Um, and that's probably why I was able to have some insight into the needs that exist there. And you could say, if you were so inclined, that all of the blessings that we have in modern science, uh, medical education, surgical education, etc., that we have an obligation to share those things um, around the world. And it's pretty darn good diplomacy as well. So I call this the new humanitarianism because I think it extends or should extend further. Uh, I gotta get. Uh, wait a minute. Okay. Now, over time, I learned that um, there are a lot of problems. And if you're a physician, your job is to solve some of those problems, right? And so these are some of the problems that you encounter if you go. Um, you'll see extreme poverty, the likes of which we have never seen in our lives in the United States. Our poor people, whether on the Indian reservations or the mountains of West Virginia or the hills of Tennessee or the city of New York or whatever, they can't come close to what exists there. There's a lack of modern technology. What we have is all donated. There are deficiencies in medical education, and boy, is that ever true. Um, there are low resource environments. Uh, there's no money to um, buy things um, in medicine. Um, the government spends 20 some dollars a year on health care uh, there. There's almost no research, and certainly no research education. There's an enormous burden of surgical disease. As a matter of fact, if you take uh, the world, and particularly Africa, the burden of surgical disease far exceeds the combination of AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis, and all infectious diseases. So there's something that needs to be done. Um, and then, of course, some of you are aware of cross-border violence. Um, which makes this more complicated. Now, this is just a way of looking at that. There are close to 150 million people uh, in these countries of East Africa, which is where I go. Some of my colleagues go to West Africa, Nigeria, etc. Um, and you have some idea that the population, um, for example, population of these states is something like what they see in East Africa. Um, and so you have, uh, whoops, excuse me, you've got uh, Kenya where I go, Uganda next door, which I get into, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania, um, and then right next door is Somalia, which is a problem. Ethiopia, which is not so much of a problem, and Sudan, which is a bad problem. So we've got a problem in terms of being able to deliver care to many parts of these countries. And uh, if you look at the human resources in the United States, we have about 50 surgeons per 100,000 people. In West Africa, there's a half a surgeon per 100,000 people. The COSEXA is a, uh, an acronym for the accrediting organization in East Africa that accredits surgical training programs and gives exams. And many of us are involved in that process uh, because they've been trying to develop the American Board of Surgery system. And there is a tenth of a surgeon per 100,000 in those countries that I just showed you the map of. And the ratio is obviously 
enormous. So uh, if you look at pediatric surgery, which is what we three guys are, um, you'll see that um, with a population in these countries, I'll let you read that for yourselves. That's why you had to move down front. See? Um, and the number of pediatric surgeons in Kenya, which is where I spend most of my time, um, 43 million people, and there are now actually 11 pediatric surgeons, one of which we trained. Um, and then you can see the other countries. So there are 23 pediatric surgeons. Well, if you take the number of pediatric surgeons in Kenya, we have more than that in the city of Nashville. More than that in the city of Nashville. So this is a West African analysis. Uh, and it, uh, I won't go into great detail. It basically shows the same um, big problem. Well, if you take the number of surgical cases, which are important to fix so people can work and earn a living, because most of them do manual labor, uh, you can see where there's an enormous need for surgical education. There's one pediatric surgeon for 2.2 million children in Nigeria. In the United States, there's one pediatric surgeon for 67,000 children. In East Africa, there's one pediatric surgeon for 4.4.5 million children. So if you go, you'll be very busy. The burden of disease. Um, and this is uh, a bit about um, the distribution of health workers by level of uh, health expenditure. So more health expenditure, minuscule health expenditure. Uh, and the burden of, this is surgical disease. And you can see um, how uh, the workforce all of it is clustered in the high-income countries. And there's virtually no workforce uh, for all of this. And it just shows the size of Africa compared to combined countries. Well, uh, and I have to tell you, I've taken all these photographs. That's my disclosure, my only disclosure. Um, basically, there are these um, camps, the United Nations camps in um, this is Kajabi, where I work. Um, I'll show you a better map than this. Um, this is one of five large refugee camps on the border with Somalia. This is what it looks like, where the people live. There's a common well and uh, sanitary facilities. And the people live in situations like that. There are over 500,000 people, about 100,000 people per camp. They're run by Medicine Sans Frontiers uh, with lots of surgeons. But you have to understand, one is Medicine Sans Frontiers France, one is Medicine Sans Frontiers Norway, one is United States, one is Great Britain, and so forth. So there are many, many countries involved in these uh, efforts. Um, now the immediate needs then are surgical educators um, and students and residents can be educators as well. And these are uh, obviously people. This is Dick Bransford who's one of the founders, uh, who's a fantastic man. He's worked all over the Horn of Africa. Um, a, a Canadian, Dan Pinaro, um, who works there. Eric Hansen, who's one of my colleagues from Vanderbilt, who's now there full time. This is Dr. Hansen, uh, the Dr. Pinaro, and that's somebody you saw. Now this is the map of Kenya, um, and uh, Nairobi is down here, and uh, Kajabi is here. This is Lake Victoria, and the road goes into Uganda. Um, this is the border with Somalia. Uh, this is Dadaab, and the camps run all along that border. This is Garissa, where they had the recent 
massacre of students at a college, the College of Garissa. Um, and you see that the camps are within that border. This camp is 90 miles from the border with Somalia. The Somali uh, al-Shabaab uh, al-Qaeda people come out of Somalia. They generally come this way and enter this way because they have access to boats and come in in that fashion. They can come across this border. They've crossed this border into the camps. Um, and they pretty well tell us when we can fly over and when we can't uh, because of when it's uh, dangerous. But it gives you some idea that um, probably nobody's ever going to go way up into the hills of um, Kenya just above the Rift Valley because it's too hard to get there and they wouldn't get out. So uh, uh, these terrorists are like anybody else. They just as soon go home after whatever they do. So we're not terribly worried about that, but there is security. And we have Vanderbilt residents and some students who go, and so we're very cautious about uh, that. Uh, what are the resources over there? The biggest place is in Nairobi. It's the Kenyatta National Hospital. They have this big hospital, and they have good accident and emergency thing. Leading cause of surgical deaths is road trauma. Um, and they have a number of initiatives, uh, AIDS vaccine initiative with the University of Nairobi. That's the university that we work with. And what are you going to see if you go, right? If you go. Um, there are times when you have a weekend and you can go see animals. They're all close by. The Maasai Mara is about uh, three hours from Kajabi, which is way up in the hills. That's be nice if you could go as the crow flies, but it, the roads are unbelievable. Um, but you'll see world wonders like the Great Migration. And then you'll see some things like this. Well, I've, over the years, I've, I've gone to two places. One is Naivasha, which has a district hospital. It's a large city of about a million people. Um, but this is what you see. This is the Happy Valley supermarket where we buy food. Um, and they've had a problem with AIDS, as you know, although that's beginning to abate. So the coffin business has been a very good business to be in. And people um, value their traditions and their families, and so they'll spend their life savings on a death and the way things had been going. Fortunately, with the uh, PEPFAR program of um, George Bush, um, and the Gates Foundation that has turned around tr tremendously. We don't see children any longer uh, being born with AIDS. So that's good. Market day, occasionally have to go to market to buy certain things like meat, uh, some things like that, but you can get it. Um, and it's very interesting to mix with the people. Typical village home. This is where they what it's like. And if you go into that house, there'll be a goat for milk. There'll be some chickens, etc. cetera. And uh, our, we have a, an Ansley group that helps us with construction um, and a little public health activity. And this is a family home. Um, this is a family that lives there. This is what it's like inside. Dirt floors, they're pounded so firm, it's like cement. Um, but this is what they've got in the way of furniture. They're very proud of what they have. A bed, they might have four children sleeping in that bed. And a charcoal thing for cooking. Nearby, there's a small Catholic um, clinic run by a group of sisters from Nairobi. Um, all of whom are nurse practitioners. These ladies have been working there for years um, and they have this little village dispensary but they also have the only source of clean water in the city of Naivasha of a million people. So you can understand what that problem. 
And this would be a typical finding of people waiting to go into clinic. Um, that line just extends all the way in to the clinic building. This is in Naivasha. Now, if you go, what will you eat? This is the typical fare that you, they have. One is beef stew, or it might be lamb stew, or it might be pork stew, but it's usually beef stew. The only one problem with it, it's all sinew and ligaments and so forth, and you're hard put to get any meat out of that. But there is flavor. Anyhow, that's uh, typical. They are big on starches, um, rice, and this is, may not look so appealing here, but it's an absolutely delicious mixture of potato, a particular type of bean, and peas. And it's out of this world. Believe me. Take that on faith. And then other vegetables, they're all fresh. So if you go, you'll find that you will drop 10 pounds in no time. I like it because in two months it, I'm back and, and trim. But you do a lot of walking uh, and so forth. So anyhow, that's sort of what you like. Well, how do people get around? Well, they don't have cars. They may, um, for a small amount of money, ride on the back of a motorcycle. Or they go in a matatu, which is a van. Uh, and they may wait for hours. And as you can see, this is a typical sort of person who comes into our clinic. Now this is the Naivasha Clinic, and this um, is a clinic for children. This is only pediatric surgery clinic at this particular time. And they all sit outdoors. This was a new building at the district hospital. Um, and this was my exam table. It was a bench, and it, it was so low I found it difficult to examine people. So they were building another building next door. So I got some people to help me bring in these rocks. And I have an exam table. And that went on for five years until finally somebody brought a, a proper exam table in. Um, it was a sink, but no running water in that sink. So it was hard to wash your hands. So you'd use the hand sanitizers, etc. Visiting hours, what it looks like. It's a semi-tropical area. And this is the maternity ward and nursery, the original one. My wife worked in here. Um, now she helps out in the, uh, in the next one I'll show you. Um, and she would get me to come in to see babies that she thought needed to be seen surgically. That's the new hospital. Money was raised from um, European... Uh, flower farm owners. All of the flowers sold in Europe are grown by Lake Naivasha in this city. And uh, they're mostly Dutch people, uh, but they got together and donated uh, this building, which is a more modern building. Um, and um, so we've been able to get donations to do things like prenatal ultrasound and uh, things of that nature. The biggest um, need for women is good obstetrical care. The number of obstetrical injury, injuries is staggering uh, because it's basically unassisted childbirth. Um, and now some of that's beginning to change because of outreach clinics from places like Kajabi and, and so forth. So this is a nice place. But it's not complete. This is uh, the hospital. Uh, outpatient department for women. There were so many patients who came for the new unit uh, from all around that they needed help. So we I have to unabashedly say we stole this tent from the PEPFAR people and uh, donated by the United States. Um, and we would see children here as well as, um, as women. Either you pay or you go without care. That's the way it is there. There is a medical insurance, um, but uh, if a child has a major malignancy and the family has no money to pay for chemotherapy, that child dies. There's no, there's no other 
um, way for that to occur. Now we have a grant that has to do with Wilms tumor at the present time uh, and uh, we have funds in that grant to take care of the children and transportation costs so that they can get follow-up and can get their drugs. Uh, this just is a list of fees and it's very inexpensive and you'll notice at the very bottom children under five are free except for the bed fee also except for having an operation. So we're able to, we have some funds to cover that. This is the pediatric ward, um, which has 30 beds. It's what it looks like. Um, kids love to have their pictures taken. Um, this is what you might call the NICU at uh, Naivasha District Hospital. And mind you, this is a hospital for a huge area. Um, this is the PICU. There's no ventilator in this hospital. This is a nursing team because we never have 30 patients. There are always 60 patients, two to a bed. Um, and this is one of the head sisters. This is her associate. They have this type of outfit. Um, this is a technician helper and this is a student nurse. And they take care of 60 patients and at night there's one of these ladies there. They rotate every fourth night. Might be a technician. This is the only scrub sink at the hospital. This is what general surgery looks like. Um, in our team, this is a general surgeon uh, from Iowa. Um, an obstetrician gynecologist who also does general surgery from Chicago. He's one of the people who's been trained and then a general surgeon who was visiting from Uganda, a missionary surgeon who works over there. And this is my pediatric surgery team in Naivasha. Um, this is an absolutely wonderful person who's a head nurse, but he could do any operation I can do. Any, any operation I can do, he can do as well. Um, oops, I'm sorry. And the two ladies who work in the operating room, and he's a, a resident who was training uh, with me at the time. So it's very much one-on-one. -on -one. And there's Michael, uh, who's my friend. We email together probably once a week. And the only light in the operating room where I work is that. Now, I bought him one too, so the two of us have a light when he assists me when we work. And for example, if a, there's a child with a bilateral hernia, he does one side while I do the other, so the operation gets over with quickly. And this is the kinds of disease you see if you go. One is um, biliary ascariasis with intestinal obstruction. It's not uncommon at all. And you get an idea of what the people are like, their tribes. And hypospadias, if you go over there, you have to do everything. You have to do urology, you have to do orthopedics, simple orthopedics, because there's a lot of osteomyelitis, et cetera. Um, and obviously all kinds of general and thoracic surgery. And I'm just showing you examples of some of these things. An anorectal malformation, the incidence of anorectal malformations in East Africa because I don't have data otherwise, is about five times the incidence that it is here in the United States. Now, there'll be answers to that. There's a biological answer to that someplace. So an experience like this can make you think about why. And sometimes it'll turn you on to want to figure it out and maybe do something about it. Um, so that's one thing, but if you look at the list of operations that we have, um, we probably do six pull-throughs for imperfect anus a week. A week. So you know there's something wrong. A lot of burns. I, I ended up doing a lot of contracture releases. Now I just linger for a moment and you see this child? You see his clothes? That's the only set of clothing he's got to his name. So my wife brings a trunk 
of clothes for children every time. But for her first year she saw this, uh, she does that. That every evening, the mother washes it out, hangs it in the yard, and the child has it on the next day. Unless you bring something. So my wife has brought a lot of um, blue jeans and things like that that last. And this is my wife. Um, I'm very proud of the, many of the things that she's done. Um, she's developed a program of occupational play therapy. She's not a nurse. She was never that. She was a mathematician. So she picked it up. And what she did was to develop a program where children would have to do things in an active fashion uh, that were appropriate for children. And so she's dealt with burns a lot um, and helped out with washing them and so forth and so on. So you go, you don't have to be an expert, you fit in. And this is Kajabi, which is where I spend most of my time and where we've developed our programs, all based on prior experience. And so I, we have a number of colleagues who've gotten together. But this is the compound at Kajabi. Uh, and it's supported by a number of organizations. And the main part of the hospital where I work is in the children's hospital called Bethany Kids. And there's a foundation for that and so forth. Um, this is the hospital. And it's a tertiary care hospital by African standards. This is the emergency room, and this is a large clinic, but there are other clinics as well. So I'll run through those. This is Kajabi Town. So we live in a little guest house there, um, and we buy our food and so forth there. Um, this is the road. It's about a little less than half a mile walk to buy your groceries there. And there's a market. You go down a little hill, and there's a market there as well. And this is the shopping center. Um, this is the little super duka. A duka is a shop, so that's a super market, so to speak. This is what well, they call it a hotel, but it's really a little restaurant. Um, and they have some of the best food you've ever eaten. Uh, and I've never gotten sick there. So that's important. But there are some other things in, in there as well. This is the fruit and vegetable market which has really luscious things. And we go usually in September and October. This year we were there till Thanksgiving. And we happen to, that's the time of year when you get fresh strawberries. And so we always have fresh strawberries in the house uh, so that we're a little Americanized. But they have bananas and all those things grow in that area. And the people get to know you and even save good things for you if, uh, and this is what life is like in Kajabi town, what the living is like. But they have nice things as well, such as the most beautiful flowers you've ever come across. Um, and good for photography, um, which I like. Um, so that their lives are, are rich in many ways that perhaps we haven't cultivated. None of these people are sad about their condition. They're some of the happiest people you've ever come across because they have strong family values. This is the only anesthesiologist for 100 miles, um, Mark Newton. He spends nine months a year there and three months at Vanderbilt. He's a pediatric anesthesiologist. He's trained every nurse anesthetist in this entire region for millions of people. And that's his wife, Sue. And my wife is Susan. Um, and you can see that um, we're on a height right over the Great Rift Valley. And just over here is a refugee camp for displaced persons, internally displaced persons. We have clinics there. Um, this is what the surgical clinic is like. You can't see into it. Um, but we have three rooms, and we turn them through quickly. We have clinic every Tuesday and then drop-ins every other day. Uh, so every Tuesday we go from early in the morning till late at night. Nice pediatric rooms. They're all decorated. Every child has his or her name over the bed. And this is half of our patients are Somali refugee children. 
um, the United Nations had an initiative prioritizing child care. And so um, we are one of two places that receive patients from the Dadaab uh, camps. And what patients get a pass to travel to Kajabi, it's time limited and then they have to go back. But that's in every chart of such a child. You have to translate Somali. I don't know about you, uh, but I don't speak much Somali. Uh, and you can imagine getting informed consent under those circumstances. But we have people who, like this gentleman who's a missionary person, uh, who's from Germany, and he speaks fluent Somali. Uh, and then this lady is from Nairobi, but she's Somali, and she speaks fluent Somali. And this is one of our surgical trainees who's going to be a pediatric surgeon. And this is probably the saddest sort of thing. When children come in uh, from these camps, you can see it on their faces what their lives are like. They're very poor and so forth. And how over, let's say they're in the hospital a week or something like that, they get transformed. And I, I always feel badly when they go back. Uh, but you have a feel for this. When you bring them to the operating room and start an IV, they never cry. So you can figure that yourself. This is our NICU in sharp contrast to the government hospital. Um, all of these things that you see are donated. They have no money to buy it themselves. But we have uh, donations from, that come from all over the world. Um, we have uh, two infant ventilators. Two. So several times a week we'll have neonates. And we may have three who need a ventilator. And Dr. Newton and I, or Dr. Hansen, will sit down and we have to make the decision about which one doesn't get the ventilator, because that's all we have. And this is the main ICU, and we do have children in here. Um, and we have one pediatric ventilator here. The others are for adults. But we make them work out. And it's a great flurry of activity of teaching in this unit. I don't know whether you can see this, but there are two anorectal cases of bilateral orchid apexy, a hernia repair. Um, other times there might be more um, tangential excision of burns and so forth and so on. And this is what that's like. Uh, we do a full range of burn care because there's no place else to send them. There is no burn center any place. Um, whatever happens, they have to be cared for. This is a child who had a Mainz pouch, urinary bladder reconstruction uh, with urethral reimplantation. Um, and we've learned to do all of these things um, and how to take care of them. Agneta is the name of this uh, Kenyan doctor who is a wonderful person. Um, and you can see in her action um, what sort of doctor she is. I'm happy to say this, uh, while I was there, we now have three such patients. The very first survivor in that hospital and in that region of Kenya was this, uh, of gastroschisis. We had also had the first survivor of esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, and why? Because we had trained enough people over a period of a few years to take care of these children. Um, and you can see that that child's kind of tight, um, but he went home and uh, we have now two others. So I'm in touch with Dr. Hansen on a regular basis and I think he's had another one since. But we've also had some we lost. We do have TPN, but it's hard to keep it clean. 
esophageal stricture. We think that this was from gastroesophageal reflux, uh, and I think you have a good picture of that. Believe it or not, that did dilate up. Um, we uh, got a string down, dilated it, also did a fundoplication, and got away without having to do anything with that esophagus. We do have endoscopy. Um, now, we don't have a radiologist most of the time, uh, so we do all of that ourselves. Uh, every contrast study we do in the operating room with a C-arm uh, and a monitor. And the way we get a picture is we take a camera, hold it up, and you take three or four because the picture jumps on the screen, uh, and you can get a picture of this quality if you work at it. Child with a Wilms tumor. Um, looking at me like, I hope you're not ever going to do like that, <laughs> what you did to me there. Anorectal malformation, it's had a posterior sagittal anorectoplasty, with, and there's hypospadias, you see a perineal uh, opening, that it will be repaired later. Cloacal malformation. Um, we really don't have, um, we're, we're fortunate, we've, we've now got some silo material for prosthetic staging of repair of, of abdominal wall malformations. So we use esporotic agents, mercurochrome or betadine, and this shows an epithelialized, um, this was a huge omphalocele initially, and getting ready for closure. Now what do you do about things like this? This little girl came in from one of the camps, a Somali child, with this huge hepatic tumor feel it, she could barely eat. Um, so we biopsied and it was hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's, it's illustrative of what would happen to that child here in Morgantown. Well, you know what would happen. That child would receive chemotherapy, they'd be cared for, etc. Unfortunately, a child like this languishes and dies. So there are thresholds of what you might see and what you can do something about. So if you go, you have to have some perspective on what's possible, what's reasonable, what's reasonable for that place, and how you can train people so that they can pick up. Cleft lip and palate. We have a cleft lip and palate program. I don't do those, but Dr. Hansen does. And uh, he is actually certified by Operation Smile to do these, and he's, he's an excellent surgeon and can whip one of these out in about an hour. Now we do these. Um, we have laparoscopy. Um, now this uh, trainee just finished, um, and he's now on the faculty. Um, and this person is going to finish this year. So we're training African surgeons, and we integrate a fourth year Vanderbilt surgery resident into that. Um, but, and then this person is one of the two OR uh, scrub technicians. Now, is Andrew and Joseph, those two people work in this pediatric room, room five of the eight rooms at Kajabi, um, and those two also could do most any operation. For example, if you're going to debride or burn or do a skin graft or whatever, you, you'll never have assistance like that. But they've all been trained from working with us. And this is a child I saw this last trip. This child was severely ill with uh, tuberculous pericarditis um, and was in severe congestive heart failure from constrictive um, from a, a pericardial effusion, I should say. And um, I think you can see the x-ray, which shows this child was also anemic. Nobody had ever done a pericardial window before, so uh, I'm demonstrating to this person who had just joined the faculty um, how to go about that. They, didn't ha they don't have anybody who can really teach thoracic surgery. So there's a need for that. Even some of our residents can do that. Cholodocal cyst with jaundice. 
we actually did a conjoined twin separation. That's I, one of the things I was going to talk about, but Dr. Naokiyama said no. Um, I was going to talk about conjoined twins tomorrow, but only for one reason. Because there are three people at the institution, this institution who have worked with me on conjoined twins. Dr. Nakayama, Dr. Shorter, and Dr. Ross. You're, you're I guess, dean in between. Um, and uh, this was a very simple, straightforward case. Or we wouldn't have done it there. And this is Dr. Hansen um, working with me, who could very well have done that case. Uh, we see a lot of uh, orthopedic problems. Um, we do have an orthopedist about nine months of the year, a fellow by the name of Mike Mara. Um, this boy had uh, bovine tuberculosis. Okay, well let's finish up with this. So what, what have we tried to do? Because I gave you a list of problems in Africa, and maybe you could transpose that to the Middle East or Far East or whatever. Um, but this is what occurred to us over a period of years, seeing the needs. How could we influence the burden of surgical disease? And a number of colleagues uh, that I've had the pleasure of working with and, and I decided that we would try to develop a university model so that they would be able to uh, proceed in the future. And so uh, what we've done is to try to establish state-of-the-art care models, and that's a challenge. Uh, we've developed residency models for the locals and our visiting trainees. And our rotation is ACGME approved. Uh, it was the first one in the United States so that our residents get credit for what they do over there. Um, and we've established clinical research collaborations for training and for research itself. So they need training in how to do research because that's the only way to advance care. And they need it, and particularly in trauma care. So we have, have had a previous grant on um, research training in trauma. Uh, over there. That was in Nairobi. Um, integration with evaluation and certifying examining systems in the region. So we, we're trying to nurture that uh, as well. Um, and then collaboration with American, mainly Vanderbilt at the present time in our group uh, and other university departments. So we've been able to get it funded. The Vanderbilt model is, is as follows, and I'm uh, two of us actually uh, did the groundwork for this. My job is to be there two months a year and to fill in, and sometimes I go twice in a year. Um, and so we have this association with a unit. You have to have a good unit to work in, a model where people can train. And we've appointed two surgical faculty, uh, plus all visiting people, and I'm the coordinator of visiting faculty. Um, I told you about this, told you about this, and we've developed, so we, we've developed a curriculum, if you will. It's not like SCORE that surgical residents know about, but it's on that order. Um, and um, I think that our educational program is quite robust in that we have sessions just like we do at Vanderbilt every day uh, and some Saturday mornings. And I can tell you over there, nobody worries about the 80-hour work week. Everybody works far more hours than that. But they love it because they're doing very worthwhile work. And then the integration of uh, research and research training. And I'll just tell you one little thing, what we're doing at the present time. Um, and we've published a fair amount of this. But some years ago, um, I, and this goes back over 20 years ago, I, I noted that Kenyan children had much more advanced and lethal Wilms tumor than I was used to seeing in the United States. But they were of the same age range. So it meant that they, it wasn't all access, in other words. So we began to question whether there was a biologic basis. And so we developed this grant. And we have four sites in Kenya. I'm the local coordinator. And we've compared specimens of tumor from there and this is children's oncology group here in the United States. 
and we've looked for molecular disparities and we've studied peptide profiles of two target genes that we know uh, exist with Wilms tumor. And there are uh, different um, areas of that, uh, such as triphasic forms, pathologically speaking, which include all of the elements of the tumor, uh, the blastema only and the stroma only, and that way we, we uh, could control for histologic variability. Now, I'm not going to show all that, but we have, this is what it shows, because we're ending up here. Anyhow, the peptide profiles from the triphasic regions recognize race with good accuracy. And the theory behind this is that tribal populations of relatively pure ancestry might have a genetic profile somewhat different from mixed ancestry uh, populations like the white and black populations in the United States or in North America are identical, whereas they're different. So African blacks, at least in Af Af uh, East Africa, are different. And how are they different? That's where those peptide profiles show up. And um, anyhow, the individual profiles identified were uh, at particularly down-regulated regions were associated with treatment failure and stage. So we were getting into the fringe of so-called personalized medicine. Um, and then significant peptide fragments were sequenced, revealing cell sig signaling pathways and targets where drugs might act. So this is clinical research with some basic research associated with it. But it's something that you can do. And the implication is that if you ask some questions, there are things that maybe you can do. And so I'll end with this slide. This happens to be my favorite plant. It's a shrub, can grow into a tree. Um, I've seen it at a flower show in the United States, but it doesn't grow here because it's semi-tropical. It has to have cool nights. And the name of this plant is Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. And it comes out white. And then it turns lavender, and then it turns purple, all on the same tree. And that's why the people there originally thought of it as yesterday was one color, today is another color, and then tomorrow is another color. And it, that's almost prototypical and illustrative of what it might be like if you go. <laughs> well, I hope that that's a little something different. <laughs> but I hope it has um, stimulated you to think about having an experience in global health, um, because I think it would be enriching for you. It's fascinating stuff. Thank you. problems that your uh, local populations were having with Wilms tumor and recognize that they might have a biological basis and be that was the basis of your research. Do you have any uh, questions? I know that there's a lot of people here who have global health experiences and uh, Dr. Neal certainly has got it. Sir. Yeah. Any questions? Any comments? It was just direction. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is that uh, surgical residency open to other programs, or is that just for Vanderbilt residents? At the moment, it's only for Vanderbilt residents. The problem is we have this housing, uh, and we're trying to get money together to build another dormitory, with, which is not really dormitories, we have apartments, because most people have a style of use uh, with that. Uh, we do have
research collaboration as well as the clinical collaboration. Because clinical research is the one thing you can do well over there. But we not any, you know, locals over there. Uh, so we had that type of relationship. But, you see, the ACGME approval is only for the land purpose. So we have to get an approval and so forth. So at the moment it's not open to that. But if we get somebody to work on our grant, for example, we should want to learn that and go back and get that. John? Yes, sir. With the uh, documentation like there, like when you see a patient clinic, uh, it's right in the, uh, is it handwritten? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. It's all handwritten. I mean, like, they have computers, but it, it's, it's not like information technology. You know, uh, when you get a lab result, you either call on the phone or the nurse runs and gets a piece of paper with the result on it. From the Otherwise... Well, when you operate on something, like that, you, do you dictate or do you write down what you did? You write your note on the chart. Just like the old days. <laughs> Absolutely. And you draw a picture like Dr. Nakayama did on his notes. But that's, that's really what you do with it. And the record keeping is pretty good, but it's all short. And certainly no wax element in clinic. And you've got 60 patients to see for each doctor. It's quick and easy. And you've got a very good nursing help. So when you want to schedule for the operating room, you write what you want. Uh, and then they get you more in if they have the money. Now, if it's a special case, we find the money. How did you get to know the doctor? Uh, what did you go to the doctor? Why did I go? Okay, well, I, I can tell you very simply here. I got a telephone call. I had uh, been sharing the section of surgical sciences at Vanderbilt, and it's time for me to relinquish that position. And uh, lo and behold, one day I got a call from the American College of Surgery. Did I know anybody, meaning a pediatric surgeon, who could go to Kenya because there was a, a Catholic sister at that clinic, the Pendo Clinic in Ibaka, who had been asking for years for a pediatric surgeon because there were so many children. And her ministry was AIDS, mothers, and children, where the fathers had died of AIDS. That was her ministry, that's what she did. She had all these children in need of care. All of them were each other possible. And uh, so anyhow, I found out she had this great need. Nobody had gone. I, I wasn't quite unemployed, but I, I had given up all my big duties. And I had been going over to you should see it. I had been going to Africa, but I was primarily going to Tanzania, Uganda, and those days. And so, anyhow, I said, okay, I'll go. And uh, my wife came with me. She said, you can't go by yourself. <laughs> so she takes her. So, and uh, she's a wonderful partner to have. And uh, she sank her teeth into it as well. So I went and did that. And uh, started going every year. And I stopped at the job every year because Mark Newton and he had been trying to get me to come for a long time. So I stopped there. I also had this grant, this trauma research training grant from the University of Nairobi. So I go from Nagasha to Nairobi, and in between is the job. So Nagasha is almost up close to Uganda border. So I, I fell into it. But I was attuned to doing that because I had done that for a long period of time. And I so began to see need and something I could do. And the point is, anybody in this room can do something. Anybody in this room can have it. And it's enormously satisfying. And you can do that like every day job here. It just takes some time. It's very simple. <coughs> like I wrote this. <laughs> by, by a Catholic nun <laughs> who, uh, if 
by the way, during, uh, there was a time when there was some civil unrest in Kenya at a time of elections, and they were killing people. Tribes were killing each other in that auction. And this nun went around in her jeep and rescued people. She was not 